Thanks, Catherine, and thanks, Fred Amigos, for having me. Uh, it's been great to listen to everybody's presentations today. So uh, I hope that mine is as informative as the, the rest of the group's been. This has been great. So um, at Scoop, we work primarily with employers. So we take a slightly different look than some of my uh, peers in transportation on how does the commute impact um, the people that are commuting, the organizations they work for, and certainly the communities uh, that we live in. So I wanted to share uh, just some of the things that we've been having as far as conversations as we've we've talked to employers across the country. Um, as you know, what are the concerns of real estate and HR executives? Uh, one is really around the concentration of talent supply. So these 20 or so cities uh, represented about 40% of the jobs that were added into the year. 19 and everything that's going on, there will likely be some disruptions into um, the net net how many jobs are added uh, this year. But it's expected that these cities will still be the quote unquote winners of the new labor market. So there's a lot of people that are headed to these cities, increasing population. Um, and in many cases, employers across the country are trying to hire for the exact same type of role profiles, making it very competitive. And that's where um, this concept of employee experience has really risen um, significantly over the last couple of years. Um, almost every organization uh, entered into 2020 in a very tight labor crunch, uh, looking at uh, projected skill shortages, the need for um, you know, really uh, talented recruiters and sourcers to, to fill those vacancies. And many of the organizations in the, the uh, cities that we partner with you know, Seattle, San Francisco had already full on admitted that they were in full on hyper competition. Uh, there were millions of more jobs and there were people with the skills that were required uh, for leading digitalization, leading security, leading customer success and service and marketing. Um, and as we've talked to HR leaders uh, across the last couple of weeks, they're actually anticipating that for the most part, they're gonna, for those critical talent segments, they're gonna feel a lot, um, a lot of this pain uh, even after we uh, kind of readjust what's going on in the labor market for uh, the COVID-19 um, crisis. So uh, the general theme from the, the leaders that we are working with is, uh, you know, we can't just offer more compensation and we're certainly not going to be able to outcompensate um, as we head into this new labor market reality. Um, so what are the differentiated ways that we can uh, position ourselves in our job opportunities so that we can attract and retain the top talent. And, you know, I don't, it's not overlooked by this population for sure, uh, as you come to the, the CommuteCon 2020, uh, but most organizations really do overlook this area and how big of an impact that the way that we get to and from uh, work every day uh, uh, hits the organization's bottom line, hits our team productivity, and hits us as individuals. Um, in 2018, ADP, which is uh, probably the largest provider of payroll uh, in the United States, they did a predictive analytics study, and outside of underpaying someone, overworking them, uh, the way that they got to work was the most predictive of whether that person was going to quit um, quit their job. So higher than the quality of their manager, higher than whether they, they had found a friend at work, um, higher than the, the skills or the, the, the function that they worked in, but commuting uh, was uh, the number three predictor of someone's uh, likely turnover. On the right hand of this slide, you're seeing a bit of the state of the American commute data. Um, so we ran this across 2019, uh, but it really gives you a, a sense of across the United States, um, who is thinking about quitting based on their commute uh, or who already has. So um, a third of the, the employees that we surveyed had considered qu uh, quitting their job based on how they had to uh, get to work both by mode and distance pain. Um, and then about 20% of uh, survey responses had actually quit a job recently. So it is quite a large population of people um, that are uh, taking action against their commute, if you will. And on this slide, um, we modeled it out for one of our employer partners. So this is um, roughly a 5,000 person organization. They, every year we're anticipating about 15% of their workforce would turn over, uh, which is pretty reasonable. I think uh, in 2019, the, the national average was around um, 19%. Um, but by uh, analyzing the survey, uh, the, the employees commute, 
uh, and their intent to stay, we were actually able to see about a quarter of that turnover risk was because of the commute. So looking at distance and mode um, that these, these commuters were having, this organization was carrying essentially a $19 million turnover risk on their balance sheet um, just because of the, the commute um, itself. So we started analyzing, um, you know, what is it about the employees? And this is again from the state of the American commute, but looking at what is their experience on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so significant people feel the pain and it's, it was getting worse and worse every day. Uh, we are seeing uh, that we ourselves have a lot of personal stress related to, to our commutes. And then I thought it was really interesting that when you look at the car, uh, the car window, we're, see, we're saying uh, twice as many people uh, do we see stress as that will admit to being stressed about their, 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 their commutes themselves. So uh, we, we may <laughs> try to hide it, but we, can't, uh, we can always uh, uh, see it on, uh, on others out there. And the, the trade-off is real, and it, it's increasingly important to uh, our own health and well-being, but the health and well-being of our organizations. Um, Again, looking at where would we spend this time if we had a, uh, a less painful uh, commute? Uh, you see things around making healthier food choices, cooking with uh, their family, uh, you know, getting more sleep. Uh, hopefully everybody's taking advantage of that extra 45 minutes to 60 minutes right now that you got, we all have gotten back. Um, exercising, socializing. And then the other area that's really critical and really, uh, perks up the HR leaders especially is 20% of folks would say they would actually use their commute time to learn new skills and um, you know, really help themselves prepare for uh, the, the future of work. So we, I couldn't uh, do a presentation and not share some of the mode uh, components as well. So wanted to highlight here um, uh, for a population when they shifted from single occupancy vehicle to carpooling, and this isn't having to carpool every single day, both both uh, both ways, but even making a a relative marginal shift, so doing it a couple times per month, the population reports much higher levels of uh, life satisfaction, uh, whether their outlook on life uh, overall uh, has increased, and then just general happiness. And this is uh, where a lot of our conversations start to pivot from just kind of the logistics of getting folks to and from work to how do we integrate this into an overall employee experience and employee value proposition strategy? Uh, because these are pretty big returns, which almost nothing in the, the HR organizational toolbox uh, gives you such a, a, a boost um, on, on, on some of these mental health and well being metrics. And, um, this is I wanted to give some of the the tips and tricks um, of my conversations with with uh, organizations across the country. So where do we um, ask them to kind of spend time and energy? One is understanding their people. So we've heard a couple of times around the importance of uh, surveying and using other analytics sources. Uh, but we net we're now in a position where we can tie back really complex employee performance, employee engagement. Uh, turnover data back to things like how people chose or how they were forced in many cases to get to and from work. Uh, and that gives a really, uh, a much more holistic picture of what the, the employee experience is and how that hits the bottom line. Um, some things that come out in the surveys that we we partner with on, uh, with our, our, our partners, highlighting the financial incentive of, of smarter or more sustainable um, uh, decisions is very, very critical, and we anticipate that'll be even more important uh, over the next couple of months as uh, in, uh, work. the U.S. population for sure is going to be starting to try to look for opportunities to save on their personal expenses. The next area that comes up as critical is flexibility. So not asking anyone to commit to a carpool for life, but giving them the opportunity to, to opt in or opt out. Same goes uh, for, for other modes. And then one of the, the most interesting thing is, and it, it hopefully is uh, positive for everybody on the phone, uh, but the employees actually tell us in the, in the data that they're, they're looking for help. They don't know what to do and they're looking for that, that guidance. So um, don't discount uh, some of the methods uh, of just being a, a person on the other end of the line or responding to emails or uh, commuter buddies because those actually go a long way and it's increasingly what employees are asking for um, as well. 
Um, in the middle, it's giving managers tool, tools to identify um, their their employees' commute-related uh, attrition. So are people starting to show up late? Have they asked what types of mode options are available to them to um, shift their, their commute patterns, uh, perhaps? Uh, engaging with the HR team to really have a uh, a toolkit for how to have good uh, legal conversations uh, that the managers can have so that they can identify, not only identify the risk, but have a, a productive conversation about what the alternatives are, provide that helping hand for um, for, their, for their employees and maybe direct them to the, the transportation or HR manager that's responsible. And then of course, uh, and this will be, no news for anybody uh, on the phone, but you know, reviewing the offerings, making sure that we're setting reasonable uh, targets, take a portfolio approach. Uh, employees, as I said, no longer want to be committed to one mode for, for life, but they really would like a diverse set of offerings that kind of meet their needs as those needs fluctuate. Um, and then be ready to, to use the data that's on hand, whether it's partnering with the HR teams or the real estate departments, but tying this back into broader corporate initiatives and organizational initiatives through talent analytics, uh, pulse surveys, or the annual surveys. And I would really encourage um, anyone that's working uh, with employers to push for it not to be like kind of the, the one-time or once-a-year commute survey that Corey um, had mentioned we'd all <laughs> probably had done in the last couple of weeks, but how do we embed this into the other talent management projects and initiatives? So employee engagement surveys, exit surveys, uh, new hire surveys are all areas where we can ask uh, smart uh, commute questions uh, to get a, get a sense of just how this is playing out um, into our broader uh, organization. So I uh, put up on the, the Scoop web, website, which you can follow the uh, bit.ly link um, down below um, uh, once you get the, the links. But one is my guide to measuring and addressing the commute intact impact on your people. So this is a, a, a light version of my step-by-step -step of what we coach organizations to do to really understand how commuting is impacting their their their, pop, their workforce and their um, uh, recruitment opportunities. And then on the right, uh, I know many of you that are on the line uh, probably have already downloaded it, but we put the 2019 City of the American Commute back up on the, the website as well. So anybody that's interested um, in those two uh, materials, uh, please download them. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always follow up with us uh, after. Um, but with that, I'll, I think I ran through that quickly, uh, but uh, I will uh, see if, uh, Matt, if there's any questions. I'm trying to keep us on great. schedule. You're, you're doing great. We're, we're almost to the end and we are very close. So thank you for, uh, for helping <laughs> with that. Uh, and so, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll open things up to, to questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing all of that incredible research that Scoop has done. Uh, I know as, as fellow partners in the, the world of, of uh, carpooling and different types of sustainable transportation, it's always exciting to see uh, what research each other uh, is doing, and we, we really appreciate you being able to, to share that with us. Um, I guess one, one question that we've got coming uh, through is, um, again, kind of the, this, this similar theme, you know, like as we're, as we're looking to the future, kind of on the, on the other side of the, the current COVID um, crisis, um, any, any thoughts that you would want to share in terms of how to, uh, how to help continue to, to build trust in, in carpooling and similar sort of close contact methods? Yeah, this is uh, really important right now. Um, one report I saw yesterday was a group of uh, Fortune 500 CFOs and on what their outlook is. Um, so roughly nine out of 10 of them said that they're expecting the workforce to come back. So they, while we are doing these experiments of, of telework, at least for now, a lot of the CFOs are saying, hey, we're paying rent or we built these beautiful spaces, we're expecting people to continue to come. So that's really uh, shifted our conversations at Scoop about how do we uh, help organizations determine what maybe a staggered approach might look like? So are there populations that need to come back first? Uh, we can, um, kind of help support through carpools and through other sustainable means, um, but not have the full workforce come at all at once and kind of slowly stagger uh, the commute uh, back to the force that CFOs are expecting. And that's everything from who's around, who's gonna be coming in on day one and who comes in maybe on day 30, to even thinking about how do we expand the commute window so that maybe you know 20% of us all uh, start to do the seven to three o'clock shift and 
uh, maybe another 20% do the eight to uh, four or what have you, but really thinking about it as an opportunity to not just get us back into the status quo, but as everybody has said today, is an opportunity for really laying the groundwork for really smart, sustainable uh, shared commuting. Yeah, I think that, uh, that that's spot on in terms of the that, uh, as we heard earlier, like when, when people are changing their habits, that's the best time to try to intervene, right? Yep. And uh, by, by the time we get to the other end of this, people will have established habits of telecommuting, many of them, and, and we'll be looking to establish new habits and, and there will be different influences on what those habits become. And, and I think many of us on this call are hoping to be a part of those influences. Uh, so we've, we've got some time to, to prepare for that, but uh, that time will come. 